Beginning their careers in the Trimble County Extension Office in the 1940s, Mildred and Jean recently reunited to tell us how it used to be. We were called the homemakers and the husbands uh, decided that the better name for us would be home wreckers because we encouraged women to stand on their own and look, husband's out there spending money for tools or whatever he needs and just put in your bid to um, say, I want thus and so to help me. I don't know how far it traveled, but. <laughs> Do you all recognize those girls? Oh yeah, I took I took those pictures. <laughs> did you? Know? I did. Yeah. Mm. That's you, isn't it, Mildred? Let me see. I can't see from over here. The way the light's hitting it. Oh yep, yeah, that's, that's me. Mildred. Oh yeah, that's me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think this is this is I. Yeah. And what do we got here? Those are kind of small. I don't know if you can. Oh, that's uh, Mary Bell. Mary Carol Bell. Oh, Mary Carol Bell. She was the uh, tailoring 4-H'er uh, then. This was, this is 4-H camp. Mm. And that is a group of homemakers doing something. <laughs> That's the frozen Ohio River. The frozen Ohio River, River <laughs> yeah. I think that was in 48, if I'm not mistaken, Sylvia. That looks like it might have been down at uh, um, the Lutheran Church for that, uh, you know, every summer they had that uh, special dinner and we always went from, they always let us off long enough to go down there for lunch. Well, no, we're serving here, Mildred. Oh. That, that is me. Okay. So I, I wouldn't think that would... Okay. I don't know what that is then. <laughs> <laughs> and that's somebody cutting tobacco, so... There. They were taken probably in 47 or 48. I started in September 41. 1941. Yes. Oh, yes. 1941, not 1841, please. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only 91 after all. But I started uh, there part time because the magistrates couldn't afford to, uh, to supplement uh, another salary. And so then I worked the rest of the week at the bank. All I can remember is $25, and I don't know whether that was for the month. <laughs> I think it might have been. <laughs> that went on for, I guess, about a year and a half, and then they decided that they really needed to go ahead and hire me full time. And at that time, J.D. Talbert was a county, county agent. and. Our offices were uh, upstairs over what is now um, the Rand Insurance Office. So and, the building is still there. Yes, but it burned uh, on Christmas Eve, and I was still working. I was working on the annual report, which, you know, is such a major Christmas. project. And it was Christmas Eve, and uh, um, I looked, I heard a lot of confusion downstairs and I looked out the back window and one of the clerks from the store was outside and he said are you still up there this place is on fire and I grabbed the annual report and got out on the steps and <laughs> we didn't get back up there and that's when we moved over where um, the uh, judge's office is now right next door to the jail and it was just a two-room building then. And that's where we were when Jean came. I was sort of a receptionist and secretary. I took shorthand, did the typing, did all of the typing in the office, and greeted the farmers when they came in. So I, I used to joke that I knew all the farmers in the county and I didn't know any of their wives. <laughs> yeah, and we put out so many uh, form letters we had 900 on, something over 900 on our mailing list. And we were always sending out a, a letter for something, a meeting or information that we got from the uh, university 
that needed to be passed on to the farmers or something. And uh, they always had tobacco demonstrations and, and uh, uh, also fruit demonstrations, usually at a Bray's Orchard or down at Callis's Orchard. And wasn't the single telephone in your office? I don't remember yeah, a phone. Yeah, it was. Being... You, di you didn't have extensions then. No, no, I know. There was just one phone, mm -hmm. and I answered it. And if Jack needed to talk, he had to come in <laughs> and pick it up. Mm -hmm. uh, they decided one summer that the ladies needed to get some instruction in canning. She was Martha Washington Smith, I believe was her last name. She came here for six weeks, and... Uh, and worked with the uh, farm wives and taught them a little bit about canning, I guess, that they didn't know. And it was because of, of what she had achieved here that they finally decided to hire a, a home demonstration agent. And I think Martha was probably here about 42 or 43. It was shortly after I went to work for the, for the county. I was the I was hired as the first home demonstration agent. It was called then, 40, 47. Had three months of training in Henry County, and and I was barely out of out of college. I went I graduated from Eastern Home Act Department, and um, then when um, um, I think I came there in. July, didn't I? I think so, yeah. Yeah. It was right in the middle of the canning season. <laughs> you because, remember. Yeah, I remember <laughs> because you were involved and in, in, uh, that's how you got the ladies started. And and Mildred was talking about the county couldn't afford to pay her full full price. They they I had a um a car expense. And uh, I don't remember whether it was fifty dollars a month or maybe twenty-five. Probably twenty-five, because mm -hmm. fifty would have been a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There were no homemakers clubs. There was four. There were four each clubs because the county agent had had organized four each clubs. But the uh, the uh, homemakers were not organized. So we started in the different communities. And um, I would ask Mildred, probably, who the leading uh, homemakers or people in the county were in a certain community, like Wise's Landing or Camelsburg. And then I went out, I drove out to visit those particular women that she had suggested, or maybe Jack Dye had suggested. And... Um, uh, from that, uh, I asked them if they were interested in helping organize a group of women to meet regularly. And we ended up organizing 13 communities within that first year. I don't remember how soon they were organized, but, but um, I think when I left in December of 51, there were still 11 active clubs. Well, one thing we did, and one of these pictures is in Wise's Landing, is of homemakers um, trying to beautify the, the uh, entrance to their farms or to their homes. And, and we had a, a mailbox stenciling project where we um, had ink and, and a little, some kind of a stenciling brush mm -hmm. that we put on the uh, mailbox and named, you know, put the name on there. And Used the, a template to type. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, with different letters. Mm -hmm. And the, the number of the house. That was one project. And then we, we did things like uh, upholstering We'd take an old chair and and make a slip cover for it or a cover, and uh, we did that and and some home beautification. I mean interior. Mm -hmm. Pressure cookers were just coming into use mm -hmm. after the war, and uh, so 
we did a good bit with encouraging women to can with the pressure cooker or to, you know, to use a, a little small cooker for cooking vegetables and even meats and whatever. This, this uh, one picture here shows the um, first house I was able to get a room in. And uh, that was well, it just there, wasn't it? Yeah, there. right here. Yeah. This was this was the home of Ms. Maggie Morgan. She was a widow, and her brother had oh, had the uh, country store, didn't he, Mildred? Yeah. Right, uh, and, Ruby Glenn. And um, so anyway, I uh, the county court clerk. What was her name? Anyway, oh, Henrietta Wright. No, 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 no. Not count it. Maybe she was the uh, circuit court clerk. I don't know. Well, anyway, she had an apartment in this end of the of the uh, upstairs, and then I had one room over uh, across the way, and the bathroom for the three of us, counting Ms. Morgan and and this lady, and myself was downstairs, and so I. Um, had a Miss Morgan said, "Now you can leave your towel and washcloth down here." And um, um, of course, the whole house was cold; never was thoroughly heated. But if I were going to have a date, Miss Morgan would would fire up the fireplace downstairs and and um, allow me to entertain in her parlor. But the one thing that was so discouraging was, um, she said, yeah, you can leave your washcloth and towel right here on this rack, in this hanger. And um, I kept noticing that my, my washcloth, when I'd use it, it just had a terrible odor. And I discovered very readily that she had been, she had this little old dog, and it, oh, it was old, I guess, and hadn't, was incontinent, and so she would take my washcloth and and clean up the mess that the dog had made on the floor. And finally, I wised up and kept my <laughs> washcloth upstairs <laughs> where I could watch it. <laughs> well, we had fruit, of course, and tobacco. And Mr. Russell Hunt was the leading tobacco uh, specialist at the University of Kentucky. And he was well known in the county, and he came down frequently and gave uh, uh, classes on treatment for blue mold. That was one of the primary concerns for the farmers at that time. And then Tubby McGill was a horticulturist. And I remember he had a piece of, it looked like probably a tobacco stick, and he had a rubber tip on the end of it. And he would go through the orchards and hit the, uh, hit the limbs. And that was his method of, of thinning out the, the fruit so that they would have a better crop. But he was, he was well known throughout the state. And I don't remember what his real name was, but he was short and broad and he was called Tubby. And that's <laughs> all anybody, they never said Mr. McGill. It was always Tubby. <laughs> And, and the, the uh, specialists at U of K also were responsible for a lot of the purebred cattle in the county because they encouraged it. And I remember um, when Charlay's first came in and uh, um, uh, Black Angus and, and the different uh, breeds of cattle that they would encourage the farmers to raise. And they were always having field days for that, and field days for the fruit growers and and uh, for the tobacco growers, and and then they would um, uh, <laughs> make a deal out of uh, threshing wheat and going out uh, when that was done, because the threshing machines came around and uh, stayed in a neighborhood for probably weeks at a time, and all the farmers would gather together and assist in the harvest. And, uh, and then the wives would gather at one of the homes 
and everybody would bring in food and would, they would feed everybody. And of course, back then we didn't have paper plates either. <laughs> so I remember washing a lot of plates. Well, every summer um, we tried to take each of the, like the Trimble County, I mean the Bedford High School, the Melton High School, to Butler Park for um, a picnic. And they would swim and whatever, and then we would, of course, we'd have food, and I don't know, remember how we managed that, but probably hot dogs and I think it was, was. yeah, and and drinks, but um, also we started, and I think this rural sociology was interested in in organizing folk dancing and that sort of thing, but. Um, after after the swimming, we would do some of the folk dancing, and I'll never forget one one time we stayed too late, and I don't remember which 4-H club it was. But, of course, the county would let us have a school bus and take the kids on the school bus. So when we got back to the school, the parents were just livid. They, why did you keep these kids out so late? Do you remember that, Mildred? <laughs> yeah. About got run out of the county. Jack Dye and I, I think Jack was mostly the cause of it. <laughs> Probably so. <laughs> oh dear. But then we had um, contests in, in the uh, clothing and the, girl, the younger students would make aprons and towels, him to towels and, and make pot holders. But by the time you got the high school girls, they were doing tailoring of, of uh, jackets or suits or whatever. And this one picture here was of uh, Linda Bell. And anyway, um, you had what was called uh, 4-H Rally Day. Yeah. And that was always in May. But these two girls had won something in the clothing contest, and so they um, they were awarded a, a trip to the university, which was called 4-H Junior Week, and that was held the 1st of June, I guess after the university had let out. And, and um, so that we took, we had, I think, five, girls and five boys were elected or nominated to go. And of course that was how many would fit in your car. So <laughs> I took the girls and the county agent took the boys and, and it was a nice um, week of them getting out and seeing what the rest of the world was about, what the university was about. So one of the projects a specialist from the university in home management came and and um, had us make have this table made that was called a lap table, and it was uh, encouraging women to have this little table on rollers that you could sit in a chair and pull this table up to you and and um, you know do your work there and or you could that was food preparation or whatever, cutting or whatever, mixing. And, or you could take quilt, you could have padding to put on that table. And uh, we taught them how to iron on that table. I didn't know if it ever worked really that well, but, but um, that, this little table was just lap high um, and and was about not more than three feet wide and maybe two and a half feet deep and um, had rollers on it and I got my brother to make this table for me. Of course, poor soul, I didn't pay him that as much it was worth, but I, I had to have the thing. And um, so then you loaded it in the back seat of your car and took it around to the different organizations. And they had sent leaders to 
uh, the county seat to get the lesson, so to speak. And, and the two women, and they were supposed to teach people what the specialist had taught them. So I just furnished the table, but then um, we were encouraged, the home agent was told now, after they give the lesson, you be sure you summarize it. And I often thought that's really discouraging to those women because I'm retelling what they did was about what it amounted to. But anyway, that was one of the things we did. I remember one, one thing that we emphasized was, uh, of course, taking care of your home. And uh, we stressed that it is just as cheap to wash windows with vinegar and newspapers as to buy a spray bottle of Windex. And of course then people didn't or have use that Bonami. much money. Yeah, yeah. Bonami. That was a white substance that, that you put on damp and then wiped it off with the newspaper. The uh, refinishing furniture was a big project mm -hmm. and and um, the the women would were encouraged to bring a small piece you know, if it was a picture frame or a mirror or a little bitty table, and and we um, had the supplies and and right there, of course, you they uh, uh, were demonstrated how to do it, and then they could get involved. And another one was making aluminum trays. We had a big piece of flat aluminum, and we had a crimper that crimp the edge of it, and then you... Um... I, have, I almost brought mine. I have one that my cousin made, but she, she made it in home in uh, uh, Homemakers, and mm -hmm. uh, she made it and gave it to me one Christmas. Well, there are several of those in my home I could have brought, yeah. too. And but... I have one of those lap trays that she also made me, but mine was rounded that would fit over the arms of the chair. Mm-hmm, yeah. And I still use it. But one thing that they did not cover that you do now is finances. Right. That was, that was basically, I think, a man's world back then. One thing that I found interesting when I came here, Frank uh, Bell was the editor and owner of the paper at that time. And every Monday morning, he was disturbed about what he was going to put in his paper. So he'd call me up and he said, Jean, I need to fill up this paper. You've got to get me something over here. And of course, we were expected to have, have a column. And of course, it didn't always work. But <laughs> yeah. but we, had, we were expected, the county agent and I were both supposed to put in publicity or what's going on or sometimes it was just copying something that the university had sent out, but he wanted help. <laughs> <laughs> we tried to oblige. When I first came and I had asked Mildred or Jack Dye, what, who's the key person in this community that I should go talk to about organizing Homemakers Club? And I was told to go to Mrs. Bruce Stewart. She knows everybody in the community, and and um, she's uh, very she vocal, would, and she's very gets very enthusiastic and very outspoken. Very. <laughs> so anyway, I I said, well, tell me where she lives, and I went down the road down down um, 421 here, 37. Yeah. And um, I come up to this old house. And um, I hear somebody playing the piano. And I thought, well, I don't see any car or anything around. And so I knocked on the door. And finally, this young man comes to the door, and he doesn't have a shirt on. <laughs> and I told him what I wanted. And, and he said, well, I'm her son, but she's over so-and-so, and she'll be back. And so we had a little chat, and, and I told him what I wanted, and so on. And, and that was the beginning of our 
being acquainted. He was then a student at the university. And, um, I think so. And we became engaged and were married. And then when Robert was in the military, Air Force, and so he went overseas and I couldn't go. So I went back to Miss Myrtle Weldon and I said, I thought my husband was uh, going to uh, be gone and I could go with him, but I can't. And so I asked for another assignment. So that time I went to Spencer County. Well, very few women worked when I was here. That's right. Outside the home. And uh, actually, so. I guess probably my class in high school was one of the earliest classes to go to work because we graduated in 41 and World War II started in December 41. And uh, everybody went to work. And that was when uh, they started Rosie the Riveter and, and all of the um, manufacturing company jobs for women. So that it was a whole different world right after I got out of high school. You've probably heard more than you ever wanted to hear. Probably so. <laughs> oh dear.